Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like to begin with this verse, and I wrote it specifically in the bulletin. You can take it home with you. And the next time that we have a storm in our life, whether it be natural disaster or man-made disaster or even our own spiritual connection with God, these are words that are important to remember from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So it is by faith, once again, that we look to God and his mercy and grace and to help us face the different and the challenges and difficulties within our life. So I begin with the question, how do you act and react to a storm? I know how I do. I, I get into preparation mode. I make sure that everything is in its place. I test my flashlights. We even put up the shutters. We made sure that there was food made. And everything was kind of in order. We even had towels just in case there was damage. We had the towels ready to go. And sure enough, we even had sandbags prepared and ready to go just in case because five years ago, our house had been flooded. And there is no worse feeling than to just see water rising in your home. And so this time I said, I'm going to be prepared. Well, it's interesting how I reacted. My dog was the exact opposite. Our dog, Snowy, the moment that he heard the beeping and the alarms going off and the tornado watches and the TV and everything, he ran into the bathroom and jumped in the bathtub. <laughs> and he stayed there just shaking the whole time of the storm. And I'm thinking, you poor dog, there's moments of respite. Come on out, come and eat. No, not going to eat, not going to do anything but cower in the bathtub. And I don't know where you are between the two, cowering and doing nothing, being actively proactive and preparing. It depends on a lot of your personality. And a part of it is your faith. Do you really believe that God is in control? Do you really believe that God has the ability to enter into our life situations and assist us at times that we need him most. So I take you to a real account recorded in the book of Acts. Now as I read these things, this actually happened to Paul, St. Paul, while he was a prisoner and really had nothing but his faith to rely on. He was in a boat being taken to Rome to meet with the emperor. He had claimed Roman citizenship. By doing that, he could proclaim and ask for a meeting with the emperor. So they get into a boat, and the description of this boat and what's happening, and there are four major players in this boat. There's a centurion, a soldier in charge of a hundred individuals who was Julius, and he's kind of in charge of law and order while on the boat. There's the captain of the boat who's in charge of kind of how the boat's handled and what happens as they're going on this journey. But it's a cargo ship. And so included within this is the owner of the cargo. So he has a vested interest that his cargo remains safe and finally there's a prisoner, Paul. What happens to the boat? A huge storm comes up, a storm with winds that we experienced over the past three days, four days. And as this boat is being guided, they realize that if they left the sail up, the mainsail, it would tear to shreds. So they brought it down and they left themselves to the mercy of the wind. And as they did so, they thought, okay, three or four days, this will be over. And I begin at verse 27. And the fourteenth day and night had come. 
They were driven up and down, and about midnight, the sailors deemed that they must be near some kind of land. And they sounded, and they found that they were at 20 fathoms. Now, nautical people will know this, a fathom is six feet, so we're talking 120 feet. What they're realizing is they have gone from the wind and the waves, now they're coming toward land, and what's the fear of sailors as they get near land? Rocks. And they did another sounding, and it went from 60 down to 40. And what happens as the sounding gets closer and land comes nearer, it means that you're near to the shore. So what did they do? They threw out and cast out four anchors from the stern. Now most boats today, anybody that's taken a cruise, there are generally two large anchors between 10 and 15 tons. And most boats have one anchor, most of the pleasure craft, some have two, but four meant that they were really in trouble. And these are pretty simple. They're just stone circles that they cast off from the stern with these lines, hoping that it will slow them down. And it's the anchors that they sought and thought of as their safety, what would protect them. But what happens is the soldiers cut the ropes and let her fall off. Do you know what that means? They panicked and cut off their anchors. I believe that within our faith, our relationship with God, there are four anchors that can assist you in the time of storms. The first anchor that I hold dear to is the presence of God. The presence of God, even when you were huddled in your home, even as those sirens and warnings went off, God was not absent. God was present there, connecting and being with you every step of the way. One of those anchors that we hold on to is God's promise that I will be with you and never leave nor forsake. So we believe that he is with us at all times, even in the midst of the storms of our life. A great evangelist, Tony Campanello, once told the story about when he was a young boy in New York City. And his mother said, you're too young of a boy to walk to school. So I'm going to hire the neighbor kid to walk you to school for a nickel a day. That yeah, sounds good, right? And for the first couple of weeks, got paid a nickel a day, walked him from his townhouse over to the school, eight blocks, city blocks crossing some major streets. And after two weeks, Tony went to his mother and said, Mom, this is a waste of money. Give me the money, and I'll be extra careful. So his mother agreed. Years later, guess what he found out? Every day that he walked to school, his mother would follow him and keep an eye on every time he crossed the street. She was there and ready to grab him if traffic was too heavy. She never had to do it, but he never realized as he went through those dangers, his mother was there. You may not realize the times that you came so close to not making it. God was there. You know, I found it very fascinating. My wife and I both said, wow, that was, there was a gust that came through our backyard. And I turned to my wife and I said, boy, we better pray. That was close. And as we're praying and saying, thank you, God, for being our anchor, all of a sudden the phone goes off, tornado warning. I'm thinking, that's a little bit late. You know, I'm sure glad God was there before the weather people were. But that's what we do. We trust in God and his presence as being one of our anchors to keep us safe. Secondly, there's the anchor of promise. God has promised you're not going to face these things alone. 
And some of you have gone through life situations that are almost unbearable. But God's promise is, I'll be there. My word will give you the faith that will be able to take it. Seeing is not believing. Believing is seeing. Seeing how God's hand can be a part of our lives and direct and guide us. And when we listen to his will, his promises become strong and true. The third anchor I'd like to talk just a little bit about is the providence of God. God knows our lives. You know, in the text, when they were talking about the sailors and all, he knows the gifts that he is able to give unto his people. You know what Paul said, and it's true, in the midst of storms when you forget to eat, that it lessens your strength and ability to face it? This is what he said. And when he had spoken, and he told them that he had a meal prepared for them, he took bread, gave thanks in the presence of them all, and when he had broken it, he began to eat and share it with others. Now listen to what they said. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took the meat. God's providence, him being part of our lives in that situation, knowing that he's present, knowing that he has promised to be there, and knowing that he provides in the times when we need it most, is such a comfort and strength for all. To get my mind off of what was happening at church, because I wasn't here and my wife said, you're not going to leave the house till the storm's over. I said, we still have electricity. Why don't I bake some cookies? Well, why bake cookies in the middle of a storm? Well, I wanted chocolate chip cookies. So that's what we did. They were horrible, by the way. I am not a good baker, but it gave us the opportunity to focus on, look at what God's given us. Even in the midst of storms, he still provides. We have shelter, we have each other, we have food, we have our dog in the bathtub. God's providence never ends. Hold dear on to that and understand what he has done. And the last anchor I'd like to talk about is God's performance. If you look how he brought Paul into safety, now this ship sank, there were about 300 individuals on board this ship, but all of them survived, even Paul, where one of the guards said, maybe we should kill the prisoners so that they don't escape. But God's providence was there and all were saved. This is such an important lesson to each one of us as we look at our own lives and look at what's happening. God's performance throughout history, he has shown us through the people of the Old Testament, through the people of the New Testament and Acts, even his own son, he was always there guiding, strengthening, and directing. Now I'll tell you something personal in conclusion. As a missionary, you need anchors. You're far from home, familiar things, languages. And when I was overseas, there were four anchors that kept me safe. And I always felt safe because of these four anchors. My number one anchor, and if I only had to have one, was God. And my faith in God was the most crucial thing to remind myself, Lord, you have me here at this moment, at this time, as he does to each one of us. God says, I will use you as my servant here and now. Anchor number two was my family. And you know, even with all of our faults and our sins, and sometimes the rejection that we get, they were still an anchor. Now things may have changed a little bit and family connections may have been strained, but that was still my anchor. And if it wasn't my biological family, it was my church family. Do you know there was a fellow that prayed for me every single day on the tractor out in Kansas, 
And every day he would, and the one time that I got to meet him, he brought out a calendar of certain dates that he had marked. I said, I prayed for you extra hard for that day. And sure enough, every time that I had gone through something really traumatic, my storm, that was the day he was praying for me. The other thing was language was an anchor. I was going to learn that language that they spoke because I didn't want to be at the case of other people. And I'll give you an example of this. The president of the Philippines came to our area, and I listened to the guy that was translating for him into the tribal language, and I thought, wow, is this guy wrong? He isn't saying anything close. I wanted to have that ability, that anchor, to be able to communicate in such a way that I was understood, but I also understand. And in the Christian church, isn't that what we do? Don't we want to learn God's word so that we better understand our relationship with God and in turn build our relationship with other people? Now the last you'll think is funny, but it was my anchor. It was a frivolous anchor. It could have been cut off at the, if I, really necessary. I could rely on the other three. Sports was my thing, and the Red Wings specifically. So in order to have that anchor, we built a hockey rink in the middle of the equator. Now, how does that work? Well, we built a concrete slab right to the side of our house. We marked it out in the shape of an ice arena. I got inland, inland skate, online those skates, inland skates, and I got also hockey sticks and pucks. And me and the kids would go out there and play out on this concrete slab, and the tribal people thought it was hilarious. But that was my anchor. What is your anchor? If you're going to hit a storm, is God going to be part of that? Are you going to thank God after you've survived the storm? Are you going to thank God before the next storm hits? And I'm not just talking about hurricanes. I'm talking about painful experiences of relationships and connectedness to one another. Number two, do you have a family? And if you don't have a family, don't you realize this is what the church is? It's the family of God. And granted, language, when the young you ruler heard from Jesus, he probably heard the most powerful language that can be spoken. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. It may have not have been words, but by his very countenance, his very appearance, you could see love for this young man. And then finally, something frivolous. Take that as your, your anchor. If it's doing puzzles, if it's doing reading books, if it's prayer, which is never frivolous, do those things so that when the storms of life come, your life is secure. And when you have to cut the ropes or others have cut the ropes, turn to God. God will direct you even when the ship sinks. We close in prayer. Dear Lord, we live in a day when it seems as if people are abandoning the ship at an alarming rate. Recent surveys indicated that people have no more time for God and the church family. But the storms of life hit us like hurricanes, and we need something solid that we can trust in. Your word, the family of faith, helps us overcome the assaults of the world and helps us have a place, a refuge that we can cling to. Lord, be with us then this day as we seek your guidance and strength in the midst of our storms. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please rise now as we rise, confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we prepare gifts and offerings to give unto the Lord, reflecting on the offertory anthem, Seek Ye First. 